Yeah, uh -huh. there we go. And not forget also to make uh, co-hosts. So I see Jarma, co-host. Wow, that was crazy. I don't know who was just in the Google meeting, but that could be really big for trash. I really hope that they actually follow through with what they're planning to do and that it doesn't end in some like <laughs> weird place. But <laughs> yeah, it is. It's super exciting. Unfortunately, we've yeah. been working on developing that technology in house. <laughs> now it seems like <laughs> Google's got it covered. Right. Um, but I honestly, mean, if they really yeah. did do that at a frequency that was useful. It's like, well, you could just pull their data. You could just pull. Yeah. You could just, you know, you can already do run the machine learning models on the, that's how we initially trained our, our right. models was using the Google Street View imagery. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you could just, they would solve a lot of yeah. problems. I bet if it was on an annual basis, I bet the regulators would accept that. I don't know for sure, but. I bet they would accept that as an alternative to an OVTA even. Well, what they need to do is the same thing that we've done is do some tests, right? Do OVTA, collect the right. trash, and do the imagery with the, yeah. with the model and see how it lines up. That's all. Yeah, it would be correlated. There'd be some sort of offset at larger scales, but I bet it would be really tightly correlated. Yeah, sweet. Okay, well... Yeah, I feel the same way because I've developed a bunch of Google Street View AIs. I've, I've worked on, been working on that problem too about like, oh man, they scooped us. But I think it had to happen because what was the alternative? We were going to purchase all of the Google Street View? No way. <laughs> I mean, there's, I just, there's just a huge downside of like having people need to drive around in cars all over your city, you know, right. the cover the entire city two to three times a year. Like that's just... Yeah. A major well, downside. Google's did already you, doing that. I mean, did you? Well, there was a pilot project, and I don't know what the result was of it, but I heard about it where they oh. put the camera on their street sweeper. Yeah. So if you're going to have a street sweeper that's driving around all of your streets anyway, you would, you know, and also it kind of helps with that compliance thing because it's like, oh, well, you see this trash? It was immediately picked up in the very next second, like whatever is in that photo <laughs> that yeah. you're using to to get the trash and rich rate of the street it's like well and then the street sweeper collected it you know presumably yeah does tra yeah do street sweepers actually get big pieces of trash i don't know how big sorry what was that German? oh i was just wondering i i mean i the cups and stuff they get i think do they okay i, I wasn't, they wasn't sure how how okay. effective they the were the vacuum assist ones or the uh, actually collecting trash. But, um, you know, I think we, if it was the same project we're, um, we were piloting here at the water board, um, we have gotten kind of stuck on training the model with the, um, you know, with the photos. So I, I don't know how viable our product <laughs> would uh, be because we haven't yeah. gotten past that part. Well, right. But I'm saying the concept, right? Like it, you know, if Google's program would work on a car that's driving around annually, would you be able to, you know, set up a street sweeper, you know, to work in the same, you know, fashion? I think like, because I think it, it's potentially a good concept. This is all, you know, who knows what would happen. Yeah. But. So I guess are you suggesting we just take their, their logic and, and attach different um, photos or you know vi video images to it, so anybody could drive around, and it, the the power is that um, their processing of it. Perhaps, or it it could just be the concept, right? Like, well, and I guess it depends on how on on what the cost would be to do that versus the cost of doing um, OVTAs. Uh, so, you know, and how much area you're trying to cover. So, you, you know, I don't, I don't know really like, but in, in my mind, I think like, well, okay, if you have this program that you get, um, 
imagery from a moving vehicle, that's I'm sure there's specific angles that it needs to um, be fed into the program to work. So if you can set your street sweeper up to mimic that that imagery, and whether you do it in you know whether it's it's done with um, you know uh, you're feeding your own imagery and you you have some kind of license on the product that's going to evaluate that imagery, or whether there's you know actually uh, uh, a way where someone else is going to come and and set up the the camera to collect imagery on your on a street sweeper that you're going to be um, performing your street sweeping on something like that i mean you know i i'm just thinking like a, as a concept <clears throat> that could be that may be something that's in the future valuable you know, not i to, think that yeah. that's it solves another problem too, Joseph, is like when the street sweepers go by, if you have parking restrictions, you have less cars in the way so you can see more trash. So that's another benefit on that side. And I do have an answer to your question of like, well, how, how much money do you save? We have a paper right now that's in review that does exactly that, right? We did the OVTAs, we collected all the trash, and we did the machine learning on the imagery. And the answer is that it takes 60 times less time to do your assessments via image capture and machine learning versus parking the car, walking it, doing an OVTA and, and recording that data. So, so vastly more efficient. So did you say you included the time to set up the, the model or training and all that stuff? Or how no, would you to do it apples to that? apples, it was just the survey time, right? So it takes you 20 seconds to drive that section of road. It takes you 20 minutes to park and do that. Do that. So obviously the front end of setting up the workflow and, and everything else, it's sort of like a time resource investment on the front end. Right. But after that, the thing that's ongoing cost-wise is the time it takes for people driving out doing the, the assessment. So if you, because there's data management associated with the manual approach as well. So if you assume those are sort of comparable mm -hmm. and you maybe you can automate more with the machine learning based approach, really that's the cost of doing the assessments are the things that carry forward and that differential is your cost savings. Right. And you should have at least training investments with the manual, like, you know, regular. There's that too. But so, I guess that's the so, same though with the image capture too. People would have to train. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is, yeah. So there's pre pre work to be done, no matter which one. But it does seem like there'd be more. With the... So whether it's Google or it's one of these, just like Walter's been working on, we've been working on it. No, no you guys have stay for. And if you guys are stuck on the training, I encourage you to reach out, Jarma. Like we've now reviewers told us to go and look at a bunch of different um, structures. So we've looked at Yolo Act and Solo and all these different mask R C N N and all these different structures. So we've got a fair bit of experience of um making things go by now and <laughs> we might be able to nice. help. Um, all right let's well, get yeah all welcome right. everybody welcome back we were uh, just a little excited after the google presentation <laughs> i don't know if folks saw that but if you're just joining us now welcome back um i we have intel let me see what time we have intel here we have until 3.15, so we have about an hour and a half. Um, and uh, I can, let's see, we got some more people rolling in. I can share my screen again. Let me see here. Um, oops, I don't know if people can see that. Let's see, here we go. Share screen, cool. Um, Got some more people rolling in. Welcome, welcome. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is the outline for today again. Here we are, breakout number two, um, 1.30 to 3.15. We're gonna have an intro. Um, then we'll have a sub breakout session. I think we might just keep it as one big group, honestly, because we have about 15 people now. Um, but if we decide 17 people or so, I don't know, we could also split off into two groups if people feel more comfortable with that. Um, but, uh, and then we'll do a debrief on the breakout session and 
a post survey and then we'll at 315 we'll wrap up and go back to the main room so let me just uh we were actually no i'm gonna stop sharing because julian i think it was your turn to present is where we were at so we're actually okay. we're gonna do one more presentation and then we're gonna do the things i just said <laughs> i think we also need to catch up on the on uh interrogating the data flow model as a group and just getting, I guess if we don't yep. do breakout groups right now, that could just be the first thing that we right. do as we transition to those discussions. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. We'll do your presentation and then okay. do the, uh, and then do the interrogation of the full breakout group or the full data flow model. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, Wow, that's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, let's see. So my presentation will have a, a little bit of a different tone. Um, and for those of you that maybe were not here in the morning, um, I'm Julian Fulton. I'm an uh, associate professor in environmental studies at Sac State in Sacramento. Um, and these are my collaborators on a project we have going funded by EPA and um, how I got involved in <clears throat> this uh, really interesting world of trash and stormwater. Um, so Ying Jin is a professor of computer science and she's uh, working on a, a, a tool that I'll talk about briefly at the end. Um, Christine Flowers, uh, uh, you're here, is a lecturer in environmental studies and also uh, with Keep California Beautiful has been in the trash world for uh, decades. And Brian Currier, some of you might know, is with the Office of Water Programs and uh, has been involved in CASCA and other, uh, lots of other stormwater permitting activities for, uh, for a long time also. Um, so I wanna talk about the trash amendments and its relationship potentially to uh, citizen and community science, which I think has a, another uh, additional role um, in helping to collect data and be a part of the overall project of, of uh, achieving trash-free waters. Um, so uh, I wanna talk about kind of this, this, this bridge or this, this connection between um, the, uh, specifically the, the actual business needs of MS4 permittees um, and along the lines of collecting data and all the things we've just been talking about, the data needed to describe this type of environment that we're looking at in this picture and changes over time. Um, this is a picture from the, the Trash Amendments website. And, and linking those kind of business needs to, uh, to the, the, the people power aspect of uh, citizen science, um, also called community science. I'll give a little bit of background on that. But, that's, that's the side that I come at it from uh, in, uh, working with students. This picture is actually taken at uh, Sac State on the levee. You can see Guy West Bridge is, is a, our little mini Golden Gate Bridge. If you ever come to Sacramento and uh, uh, come by Sac State, you have to see the Guy West Bridge. It's, our, it's one of our icons. Um, but we're right on the American River and we do a lot of um, uh, trash cleanup activities uh, volunteer. It's an opportunity for students to get engaged um, and uh, and make a difference in our local environment, um, and also get involved in management. Uh, is 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 one of the things that this has turned into as a learning opportunity is for students to uh, to be citizen scientists and to help collect data. And uh, Sac State is actually a permittee itself, and we have our own stormwater. Uh, plan that we have to implement and permit to comply with. And uh, we're starting to use students to track our compliance with, with trash amendments um, and, uh, and their uh, ability to collect data as they uh, clean up trash and, and do this stuff, do this uh, um, kind of community-based work. Um, but students aren't the only ones doing this. There's, there's groups around the state and around the country uh, broadly under the umbrella of citizen science, doing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, boots on the ground cleanup work, uh, and also starting to collect data and have been collecting data for many years in, in a lot of cases. So there's a, there's a real power there in terms of data collection, 
and helping to link those activities to the to the actual business needs that we've been talking about for um, track to trash amendments compliance. Um, so I want to give you a bit of a little bit of background on citizen and community science. Talk about this nexus between um, uh, CS, which is just a, a catch-all for citizen and community science, and uh, and government, um, and the role that that uh, uh, the, the the forms that that can take and the resources there, um, and 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 how how we might think about and conceptualize that that bridging uh, to bring those types of different organizations and work types together. Um, and, and then lastly, talk about the specific project that I mentioned on the title slide, which is a, a data exchange that I'm working on and how that might look and how it might tie into what we've also been hearing about with, with CDEN and Second Nature's tools and things like that. Um, so what is citizen and community science? It's, it, it's a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, this is a pretty boilerplate definition. Um, activities or programs which members of the public collaborate with professional scientists on scientific research and monitoring in either scientist-led or community-led endeavors. And it's, it's come under a lot of different names in, in the past, but it all, it, it really originated in uh, what was first called community-based monitoring. Um, monitoring water quality data in particular that governments, state, local, everything in between, didn't have the resources to, uh, to do. So filling this gap that municipalities, uh, regional governments, and state governments often face in their environmental management. And I think that's an important thing to point out here is that a lot of cities might not have the resources to do the kinds of, uh, to, to access the kinds of tools, the, the higher tech tools that we've been talking about, to have the uh, to, to pay city staff to the extent or pay consultants to the extent needed to collect the data needed to do this compliance. So that's, so I think citizen science has this opportunity to, to sort of help fit in there. Um, I was also going to just throw some polls that I prepared out to the group, um, but I've lost my meeting controls. Where did they go? Could somebody, I don't want any of their co-hosts put up a poll called Julian, uh, Julian one. I just can't, oh, okay. thank you. So I just wanna know if you've participated in citizen science, either in your work or in your personal life, is this something that you've heard about really? And maybe you're not sure, maybe you did some kind of volunteering that and uh, and uh, did some work for an organization, and you weren't sure if it if it was part of a bigger a bigger piece. It was connected to research or monitoring. Okay, I can actually see the results coming in. So kind of across the board, yeah. Um, but it might be something that that people are generally familiar with, and um, uh, it's it's definitely increasing in in, in relevance. Um, a, a lot of uh, I'll get to some of the motivation in a minute for uh, for why, but it's it's something that's definitely increasing among uh, the academic community, the nonprofit community, and the uh, and and government. Um, so definitely a, a becoming a bigger issue. There are lots of different forms that uh, community or citizen science projects take. Um, on the left side here, you see kind of a, a, a sort of a stepwise um, uh, list of different ways that people could engage in research or monitoring. And most citizen science uh, uh, projects could be classified as what we call contributory, which is this first col column where people that, that, that get engaged uh, help collect samples, um, do, do maybe monitoring, and maybe analyze those samples. And that's, that's typically the scope of most citizen projects. But there are other you know, deeper um, collaborations that uh, where, where the general public, people that are citizen scientists get involved in, um, in other steps of the research process earlier and later than just the data collection. 
Um, and then what might be called co-creation and links more to the concept of what people generally refer to as community science, where community groups are really part of the problem definition uh, and, and, and question development for a, for a project. Um, so this isn't to say that you know, more Xs are better and that, that every, every step, every project needs to be co-created. I think there's, there's a lot of reason why contributory projects work really well in a limited fashion, a limited engagement with, with the public. But just to get a sense of that there's, that there's different models out there for what community and citizen science look like. Could you please put up, I know I, I can do it now, uh, the poll too. So given what you know about, um, about this sort of different types, uh, how would you qualify the type of, oops, uh, the type of citizen science projects that you have participated in, those of you that have participated in? So probably very few of us have, have been involved in collaboratory or co-created science. And that's what I'm seeing so far. And just keep in mind who we have in the room. We have, we have people from, uh, from government, from municipal uh, um, MS4 permittees. We also have community groups represented. So um, seeing just a couple of people mentioning contributory, uh, but maybe a lot of us either are, are not sure or haven't done citizen science, haven't been involved in citizen science yet. I'm here to convince you. Otherwise, um, so moving on, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of going on, as I said, and it's too hard to capture in a presentation like this, but just some of the sort of core things that I think resonate with why involve citizen science in this type of work in, tra in track two uh, um, trash amendment compliance and, and, uh, and work. Uh, one is the is the, uh, the US EPA uh, uh, best management practice BMP for the NPDES system, which uh, two of which involve the public. So public involvement and participation is is definitely in line with in involving the uh, uh, citizen science and public education and outreach. That the public should play a role and that you get to check that sort of BMP box um, uh, as you're doing your compliance. There's also uh, policies at the, at the state and federal level. You see here, these acts uh, passed a few years ago, which actually really encourage uh, government agencies at all levels to use uh, citizen science and crowdsourcing methods. And very few actually do. So um, there's, it's not a mandate, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an, an encouragement really to, uh, to use these methods and there's, there's an increasing amount of guidance out there. Uh, I, I put some of this, this EPA link to the EPA um, citizen science portal where you'll find the citizen science quality assurance uh, handbook and um, this more recent report um, by the, the um, Environmental Law Institute, which actually did a, a bunch of case study uh, examinations of best practices in citizen science, specifically citizen science programs that interface with government programming and, um, and environmental management. Um, so some other links here of, of, of resources, there's lots going on in this space and uh, an increasing sense that, that uh, the general public has a role to play in state all the way down to local environmental management. And I think trash, trash uh, amendments um, is a great case for that. Um, there's a number of benefits and pitfalls, you know, that have been identified in these case studies and in the literature. Um, clearly, public engagement can be a benefit. Um, better environmental outcomes, so better, uh, um, uh, better in this case, uh, uh, trash, trash uh, cleanup and um, and the ability to use data to to do programming and have that feedback mechanism work with people at, at, the, at, the, at the wheel of that. Um, and building community capacity, which is never a bad thing in uh, a lot of our cases, um, uh, getting, getting people involved in environmental management. Um, some pitfalls, uh, clearly we're talking about a much, a much uh, a, a deeper time commitment um, than let's say putting 
uh, uh, cameras on a on a on a vehicle, um, and and potentially a financial um, uh, commitment that relates that to that time commitment, um, and and that that the idea that that there's a potential there doesn't always mean that it's going to work, and that there there has to be intentionality. Uh, uh, and benefits realized by both cities and MS4s and the community groups that are involved in them. And that's where I really, where I really wanna go next is to talk about how goals and values might overlap. So this, this, this overlapping or this, this bridge that I wanna try to, to, to connect here, and this is not to discount the, the many bridges that already exist in this space, um, but uh, I, I am curious, uh, with another poll, if you'll um, humor me, um, just try and answer this question, whether you think in your work that you work on this bridge between MS4 uh, permittees, their business needs, and community science. Just, just uh, do you have something, something going on in this space? That's great. I'm, I'm happy to hear. I see mostly people are saying that they do have some, some role to play at this, at this nexus. Um, there's what I'm seeing here. So that's, so that's good to see. And, and, and I think there's, there's always opportunities to, to, to either strengthen that bridge or how I wanna actually conceptualize it a little bit differently is, is try, to, uh, try to kind of, if we draw Venn diagrams around the interests of community groups and the interests of MS4s, that we try to widen that overlapping space to, to, to deepen that, that overlapping space. That it's not, it's not community science in service of business needs, but, um, but really an overlap in interests. And that's how I think the benefits of, of these linkages get uh, sustained over time. Um, so, uh, so how to widen that, that overlap? Um, technology is, is I think one of the, cores of that, um, uh, apps and devices that allow citizens to engage. There's a, there's a lot of examples out there. And then data platforms and standards. Um, and that's what I kind of want to key in on in, in, in my contribution in the, in the next session um, is, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the role of technology. But that has to go along with, with training um, that is that, that cities and, and MS4s can count on the data they're getting, uh, quality assured data, and uh, that there's guidance on how, to, how people can get engaged and, and become a part of the, uh, the overall project. Um, and then communication, the, the finding the, the, the vocabulary and the kind of cultural overlap that gets people on the same page city workers and community groups um, is, a, is a big barrier to, or an opportunity to build that trust, right? And there's probably lots of other, lots other to talk about in terms of how to get that overlap and, and get people working together. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce this tool that we're building that is just starting. It's kind of just getting off the ground. We're calling it now the Trash Rapid Assessment Data Exchange, um, but it's really, uh, more of a, of, a, of a community monitoring data exchange. We want this to be a place where community groups across the state collecting data in different ways can contribute their data to a platform where MS4s can actually use it uh, for their management and compliance. So, uh, so that's kind of our, our first goal is to, is to support the monitoring and reporting needs uh, of MS4s, but also the goals of community science organizations, which might be quite different, but again, finding that overlap, I think is, is, is key. Um, what we're actually planning to build is a, is a data exchange platform, uh, somewhat akin to CDEN that you heard about before lunch, um, and maybe even uh, a, a, could be seen as a lighter version of, of what Gary presented earlier in the morning session. Um, but a, a, a data exchange platform for community science groups to uh, to contribute monitoring data uh, that they're collecting, hopefully in collaboration with cities and MS4s. Uh, but, uh, and that also helps to ensure that those data are collected and processed in a, in a quality controlled, quality assured way so that can be used for management and compliance. Um, 
we're planning to do to build some visualization tools um, to to actually directly support the programming needs of MS4s, um, uh, as well as reporting. So actually getting to the to the compliance and reporting phase um, of the data flow, as we'll talk about in a minute, data flow model. And because this is a federal project, and as Gary mentioned this morning, this is a uh, trash amendments is a is a model really for other states to adopt, and it's it's only getting bigger. We're we're trying to create a system that can be replicated in other states and regulatory contexts as well. So that's the that's where we're headed. Um, this is just kind of a visual of how our our project sort of helps link uh, uh, the people power of citizen groups to MSFAR permittees and and with arm them with information and data in ways that help them actually uh, meet compliance um, all the way into the smart system. So talking about how to do that, um, mostly with, with apps and training and quality assurance programs um, and uh, finding ways to, uh, to, to, as I said earlier, accept data collected in different ways, which is a key caveat of this is community groups don't always uh, they definitely don't collect data in the same way. So what is a what is a what is the the essential kind of um, boilerplate needed information, the OVTA probably? Uh, what in addition can we help visualize and present to cities? Um, so next steps we're we're trying to kind of coordinate with other uh, data collection methodologies and uh, other work like we've heard about today, and this is this is that. Um, we're also uh, uh, collaborating with MS4 permittees on this project, and we have uh, we have a couple more opportunities to do that. So, if anyone here is interested in uh, in helping provide us feedback on how we develop this tool and working with community groups, uh, then that's that's a great uh, uh, step. And then also. Uh, Looking at the longevity of this project and have it be so it's used into the future, identifying a long-term host and uh, and of course IT support to keep it going. Um, our project runs through 2023, and uh, uh, so we'll be working on it until then. And after that, I hope we hope to have it adopted by either CDN or uh, another state agency, so that it is a it's hosted sort of at a public level. Uh, so thanks for that and. Here's my contact info if you want to get in touch, but I'll be here the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you. It looks like uh, Erica has their hand raised. Yeah. Hi, thank you. And I, I joined really late, so you probably answered all of my questions. So I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, I have a it. few questions. What You mentioned this is a federal project? Can you say who's funding, it, meaning federal funding? Yeah, the, the funding um, that we have is from the exchange it's from EPA. Grant program. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. To Sacramento State. Okay. That's yeah. good to know. And then I, um, I've i heard from, I'll say from partners, grantees, that CEDIN is not the easiest system to use, um, but that they, it just, it, it's a, it's really intensive to put information in. So I, I guess I say that as you develop. Yeah. And yeah, we're we're aware of that. And um, and we have Jarma Bennett here who, who gave the presentation on CDN this morning. And we um, so those there are there are those uh, misalignments, uh, particularly around points versus polygons and trash data um, and the the um, the uh, uh, schema of the data. How it accepts data, um, so we have to talk about that. But yeah, definitely appreciate you bringing that up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Do you know? Sorry, do you know who? Do you have a contact at EPA you're working with? Um, no, on or is the it just through topic? The no, just our, our our regional grant manager. Um, but I know that EPA just came out with a trash assessment, uh, trash monitoring method. Uh, it's called would, ETAP. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I think there's lots of good work being done in California to use ETAP's really uh, laborious. Yeah. yeah. So I, I work for EPA, so I'm yeah. <laughs> just curious. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I do need to, to connect with more. So I'd love to connect with you uh, offline or in the later. I can put my stuff. email in the chat. Thank um, you. Great. Sure. Thanks. Julian, is it okay if I give just a, a, a little bit of context since Eric was asking some questions? Sure. I, yeah. I just put something in the chat box. Um, there's a, another grant where we're specifically working within the American River Basin. Um, and it was it's um, funded through Department of Water Resources, DWR. And it's to develop the citizen science project as a decision support tool. Um, and that funding went to the Regional Water Authority. So we're working in a couple different ways to, to get the citizen science project uh, with local volunteers and college students and high school students in partnership with the local permittee. So there's data collection specifically to the American River Basin, and then there's data collection where we're working with other types of permittees throughout the state of California. We're looking for some more. Um, but this is based off of there's some other work going on with other colleges in other parts of the country with some EPA funding um, that this might be tying into with this tool that has been developed because it wasn't just about the, the um, trash uh, amendment and the uh, visual online uh, trash assessment. We're, we're actually also collecting data in this project that um, identifies what type of litter is there. Uh, is there a is there any illegal dumping? Is there a homeless encampment? And then uh, there's two parts to it where they do the data collection street side, and then they also do data collection in the nearest waterway. So we're trying to collect the most data that we can um, and see if other community partners are interested. They can follow our system or see how it would work with other types of um, data coming in. So we're not the end all be all, but we're working with a lot of different partners just to see how this data can feed in. Um, and we're collecting more than the, definitely more than the minimum required for the permittees. Yeah, and, and as I said earlier, Christine is uh, working with us on, on this project too, uh, and, and uh, keep California beautiful. Um, Jarma, I saw your question, will trade output be compatible with a format for smarts um, as data points or just as an attachment? So that's a, that's a big question for us. Um, right now, my understanding is that smarts is just accepting um, the, the, the compliance submittal for smarts is, is just uh, at this point a, a checkbox that cities MS4s are collecting data, um, but that I don't know if there's a plan for data to actually be submitted to SMARTS. Um, we tried asking that of the um, SMARTS managers and I don't think we got a clear answer because I'm not sure what the plan for that in, in years to come, are MS4 is going to have to submit their compliance data or just say that they have it as backup. Yeah, maybe it depends on um, how uh, compliance is going to be assessed or, as you said, what is required because, um, you know, smarts can accept uh, point, you know, data points as data points. And then um, I've talked to the uh, Patrick Otsuji, who works on smarts, and um, kind of thinking of ways that we could um, transfer data between smarts and seed in. Uh, we haven't realized that yet, but that, but you know, that's a another potential. So people wouldn't have to work with seed in directly. Yeah, I mean, we so we we want our tool to be able to help MS4s format their data in the way needed to submit to smarts. So what that's probably not gonna be point data, like actual survey uh, data, but, but looking at trends over time, 
uh, looking at coverage, uh, you know, percent coverage of, of a priority land use or, or, a, or a city. Um, those kinds of statistics might be submitted at some point. And so aggregating our data in ways that can be used for submittals and compliance, that's, that's, that is our goal. We just don't know what that is exactly. Gary. Uh, really cool, Julian. This is, it seems like a great role for citizen scientists. And I think another couple of benefits are like generating public support, right? Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know if everybody knows stormwater programs generally don't have a dedicated funding source. And so if you're gonna work towards a stormwater utility or something, this, right, building public support is, is important. Getting the public engaged um, help, helps to do that. And going the other direction, it seems like getting people involved in collecting data that's actually used for regulatory compliance or like the thing that solves the problem. That's on the water quality side as water volunteer water quality monitoring groups and those data generated got integrated to um, the regulatory side. That was really motivating for the volunteers. Like that really, you know, pe people feel good about that. Uh, my question is, you know, in the first in, this morning in the discussion, Greg said, uh, he put a comment in the chat that was like, well, maybe if it's not a direct integration with CDEN, these data, it's um, it's some other structure that has some level of connectivity to CDEN, but more optimized um, toward the type of data that, that we're collecting for, for trash. And it sounds like you're working towards such a structure right now. And I guess I'm just wondering, is what's your time frame on that? And is there is there opportunity to collaborate with State Water Board? We'd love to be involved to make sure that structure is in a form that's kind of the most widely adoptable and is going to work with um, the types of data that that different people are collecting. Uh, short answer is is yes. Uh, okay. All all of the above. We um, the the format of our tool, I mean, we've really only started to sketch the, 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 the user interface, but um, that, is, that is really open at this point. And we would love input from practitioners, um, like you said, all the way up to water board staff and down to the, um, to the actual MS4 permittees that are the ones logging into this website and using it for that kind of feedback, so, so absolutely. Great, we're getting closer. Yeah. And, and we don't want to necessarily create a, a, a separate system. I mean, if it makes sense to integrate this into, into CDEN, that's, that's great. But if it's, if it, like, like you're saying, if Greg was saying it's something that is apart but connected to CDEN, then that might make sense. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, the, the other is a middle ground is some level of data stored in CDEN with a way to get to more detailed data. I just, it's hard to figure out what that level of data storage in CDEN would be, but I don't think we'd, you'd want to preclude out of hand that you wouldn't store any data in CDEN. I don't know, John, do you have thoughts Well, on that? I think the, it's the other data storage place. I mean, if you had another data storage area that could do what you wanted it to do, I don't think there's any reason to try to connect to CDEN, but we don't have that. I mean, and it sounds like, yes, Julian's and his team is working on something to collect it, but they need a, they need a final storage spot too. And I don't know who can um, provide that. That's why the, the opportunity on my, in my presentation was that it exists. It may not be perfect, mm -hmm. but um, it, as I put in the chat earlier, when it was suggested that we use a different database, it, they're not easy to come by. You know, it's a long process to, um, you know, define your needs and then obviously the funding issue. And, um, you know, that process is extensive. Uh, I think for anybody, I mean, it's certainly at the water board. That's my experience that I, I've worked a long time to um, try to get a new seat in and we're working towards that, um, but we don't have it yet.
That makes sense. I mean, I think we should also explore um, uh, federal agencies too. Um, I don't know if, if EPA has something that, that would help support this, but um, like you're saying, data, data servers and repositories take a while to set up, so. Well, you could go right to um, in the WQX format, and that's um, seed and feeds to WQX as it does a lot of other things. Um, and then you can get it out through the, through the National Water Quality Monitoring Portal. And so, yeah, that, that would be an option, I think. Um, I didn't mean to speak over uh, Joseph. Oh no, that was that was cool. Um, I was um, just going to mention, you know, as far as um, thinking about your flow or uh, workflow, if you're going to, if you were going to be, you know, thinking of smarts uh, as a place to um, store data, <clears throat> you're uh, as a citizen, as citizen scientists collected data. I mean, I could be wrong, but um, as far as smarts uploads goes, um, I've only seen uploads so far from directly from the permittee or from the regulator. Um, so there would be a coordination, like, you know, if that was, if you were to be in a coordinating with a, a municipality or, you know, someone with a permit, or someone else with a permit, um, what might happen would be that you give your data over to their maybe data entry person or something like that. And that person would be the one who then takes that over to smarts. I don't think that there's a capability currently, and I don't know that it would be added for just um, someone to upload and attach something to someone else's uh, ID in that, in that system as collected. I'm sure they would want to yeah. have their own process to say this was collected correctly and da da da. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right that it would have to go through. Um, but I, I think at least the Julian had you, you had a slide towards the end where um, you kind of demonstrated that potential pathway. I think where it would go through the municipality. Is that right? Sorry, I have too many screens going. But yeah, um, no, we wouldn't. We uh, definitely would not want to shortcut the uh, the municipality. I mean, the, the smart submissions have to come from MS Forest. And um, and I think that, that that's, we're not proposing it to tamper with that at all, but rather provide the MS Forest with data that is formatted in a way that that helps them do that submittal as, as uh, smoothly as possible. So that's kind of the intermediary. Sorry, I missed that. I just want to. Uh, no, it's, it's an important point, and it also, but it also brings up the the quality assurance aspect, which which is which is huge here um, for cities to use citizen science data. Um, they need to know that it's that it's good data, and uh, they need to be able to to clean it and vet it, and uh, there needs to be that relationship, that communication, and training between. MS4s and community groups so that the data they are getting, they can, they can count on and know that they're submitting valid data to, to SMARTS. One other point I'll just mention quickly um, is that when we think about creating these things, I think there's a tendency, certainly there was on my part to think about you build something and then you just put it somewhere and that's it. And, and then people submit data to it and everything is fantastic from here until forever. But it's not, right? We need a JARMA. We need, you know, probably four people like JARMA to, the, the, the thing lives, right? It, it needs to be maintained. It evolves over time as people's use cases and objectives evolve. And so it's a big deal, right? Taking on the responsibility of a, you know, creating a new system. So we should just always definitely have that in mind what we what we might be uh, committing to. Yeah, <laughs> we go that way. That's a big that's a big step for sure. Um, and 2023 seems like a long ways away, but it's really not. So I'm glad we're getting these discussions going now.
might be a good time to start checking out our data flow model. Cool. That's kind of kind of what we were just talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's a good segue. Um, I can share my screen again. And then should we split into two groups? I guess we have 18 people right now. Maybe two groups would be good. Two random groups, is that cool? Sounds good, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, sharing my screen. Whoop. Okay. Present, oh wait, I had a pun. I don't wanna miss that. Who's ready to get down in the dumpster? <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so let's see. So this is the data flow map. And, and um, for those who weren't here previously, I will just reiterate uh, what this is. So the data flow map concept is basically trying to map out how data goes from being created to being disseminated, to being applied, to being given to a regulator. And I've created this data flow map for track two trash assessment data based off of my very naive understanding of how data might flow for, for the trash amendment data. Um, so what I think happens is that we have a creator maybe a consultant that collects the data. And then they hand that off to some database manager at the MS4, who then might submit it to an open data uh, web portal like CDN or something else. And then that database manager is also responsible for handing that off to a data analyst, who then might either give it to a, a regulator or to um, somebody who's going to apply the data so actually go out and you know do the street sweeping or or a city council member to create some new policy or something and so at this time what we're really looking for is um, before we break off into our groups we just wanted to open up a short amount of time for big picture assessments of is this even remotely right of how you have your experience of how trash track to trash assessment data um, goes around from person to person. Are there humongous things that are missing? Um, and uh, I'll just stop there to open it up for comments. I'll, I'll go because uh, ours looks nothing like that. <laughs> What's that? And then I'll go um, because our our flow map looks nothing like that. Um, Perfect. Being a non-traditional um, permittee, we essentially go from myself to myself to myself <laughs> to myself and then to managers. Okay. That's it. So, and then to the regulator. So yours You looks, change hats every time, right? You, you got to change the hat every time you do that, That's yeah. right. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I'm the person who does the um, online visual trash assessments. I'm the one who analyzes the data. I'm the one who maps it. Um, and then I essentially go to some managers, like, you know, the grounds managers, the trades managers, and just say, like, these are the areas I'm seeing that are trashier than normal or are looking better or, um, you know, what can we do to improve this in your opinion? So that's a one man show over here with, you know, just being a university um, and being right. a little different than a city. It's a lot of times like trying to fit a square into a round hole. <laughs> And so you're also cre creating the data too? You go out and collect the field assessments? That's me. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. I mean, we're, so, we're okay. campus, you know, so it's, not, it's yeah. not huge. It's not a huge area. It's um, probably only like, a, I don't know, seven to 10 block square. Okay, 
Yeah, so you can do the whole assessment yeah, yourself. Yeah, it's not, no, I'm not doing, you know, blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks of them. Um, and most of those blocks are occupied by large buildings. So not right. a lot of square footage to actually cover. Right. Okay, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. This is go very good to know. Um, other experiences or comments? Um, so if, it, you know, don't let this comment kind of derail the discussion if it's completely irrelevant. So it might be a totally bad question. Have you thought about what's to the left of creator consultant? Like what, you know, what data is that person trying to create? We're kind of focused right now on the OVTA um, trash in the street type of data, which gives the score of like low, moderate, high, very high type of data, which is fine. Um, but there are other there are other data that get gathered, like um, trash gathered from the stream bank, um, and if that's and and what sort of you know was it a a really coarse measurement like here's the volume of the trash or did you know was a count done of types etc like that so different so you might be getting different types of of data from the creator depending on what they're looking at and therefore it may have a different path right right so just a, a thought um Maybe it all goes down the same path, or you, maybe maybe we want to stay focused on the the OBTA aspect of the data uh, gathering generation. Yeah, it does seem like that is the predominant method that people are using is the OBTA or something similar to do their assessments. Um, so. We probably will want to stay focused on that for this um, workshop, I'm thinking. Uh, a, when you want to circle back to the email you sent and the, the ask for actual data. All right, I can, because um, it yeah. kind of relates to what we're talking about. So um, maybe we could mention it at the end of today too, but we uh, when sent an email to uh, should be all of you on uh, yesterday or day before to ask for people to submit actual data that they either create or are given or that uh, like a spreadsheet of data that might flow along this pathway. And I think that gets to Joseph's point that data are collected in very different ways um, and different attributes and different schema. So um, we're looking for sample data to work with tomorrow. If anybody has any that they would be willing to contribute, then that would be really cool and, and helpful. Can, can, we, can I go back real quick to Joseph's comment? Because I think that's an important one. And I'm not positive that certainly there's a predominant path, right? Because we've got documentation from the State Water Board this is a way you can satisfy your trash amendment requirements. But I think part of the task of this group is to try to put our arms around how to best use all these different types of data that are collected. So while that's the pathway to compliance by and large for everyone, for instance, if you are a municipality that implemented a plastic bag ban ordinance or a plasticware ban like they did in city of Carmel, well, those data aren't necessarily gonna help you tell that story of success or failure. Likewise, they may not tell you as much about the specific sources of trash. So there could be a different pathway for data collection that is used for a different purpose, for you know, some different management objectives with, within a city. And yeah, the pathway for that would be different. It might be just more, more internal usage. Similarly, you know, we have, we also have now the machine learning based approach. And right now there's a draft permit out for Caltrans that's fairly open-ended in terms of the method that's used to generate these data to quantify trash. In my view, it seems to be leaving it open-ended so that these image capture based approaches 
could be used, that would probably have a similar trajectory to, in terms of end users as the OVTA data, but the, there would be different stops along the way on, on the pathway. So um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe there's parallel lines on there if they're different enough, or we just add elements to this data map to, to um, represent those, those different types of data that may be collected. I think this map still works, by the way, Wayne. I think it's, it generally works. We just may get uh, built out a little bit in our discussions. And the, yeah, the, jam, that's the jam boards are, are intended to, to sort of uh, build out each one of these steps. I think we just want to know whether the steps, no matter who's doing them or, or what, how, and where, uh, that the steps themselves are more or less the right steps. Right. Yeah, and um, I guess along with the, to bounce off of both Joseph's and Gary's comments, are there other data sets beyond OVTA right now? So you have like OVTA, AI, trash AI, and or like image collection. Are there other things I that mean, people are using? Uh maybe um okay well so I, I will tell you um one thing of that i'm aware of but it and it informed a management action which is viewed as successful right so um basma well actually they changed it it's bakwa now but back in the day uh basma um did a study um throughout the uh, phase one permit region in, in the SF Bay area. And they went to their trash capture devices and removed the trash from them and characterized the amount of different types of trash that was in each one of those devices and discovered that around 5%, and this is early on, like 5% um, of the trash was ish. You know, there's, there's some variation, but high level around 5% of all trash in those devices was plastic bags. And so they said, hey, this is good information for us to use to put a plastic bag ban in place. And so that's where we, um, and then, so that's where we saw plastic bag bans come in in our region was they, you know, had some information that they, Whole, like they got it from their trash capture devices. They took the trash out of the device and said, okay, the trash that's in this device, 5% of it is plastic bag. So if we ban plastic bags, conceivably, right? Theoretically, however you want to say, ban plastic bags, you just got rid of 5% of trash in the whole county or, you know, how city, whatever level it was. So that, that's an example that I have of, um, data that wasn't gathered through OVTAs, um, but that was used to inform management actions. Yeah, thank you. That's really useful context. I didn't realize that that was also happening. Um, I think our, our early conversations got me thinking that like OVTAs was like pretty much the only thing happening. Um, so yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I think it's the common denominator though. My, my sense of the different ways uh, groups are collecting data. Some are collecting counts, some are collecting weights, some are collecting um, different attributes. And, uh, but because OVTA or whatever one through four scale you wanna call it is, uh, is necessary, it's, that's the common denominator. And anything up above and beyond that is, is great for management purposes, but, um, the common denominator is for compliance. Yeah, there's just way more of it. You know, everybody's collecting. So it makes sense to focus <laughs> on it because there's way more. And I'll just say the, there's also those same qualitative style surveys, several MS, several phase one communities are required to do that in the riparian zones. Um, so it's a similar, you can have a similar structure. It's just, it's a little bit different because you're, um, you're not on a street, you're just in the, in the riparian zone. 
So like Salinas, for instance, has that requirement in their permit. But I think whatever we come up with for how to deal with OVTA data applies to those type of data also. But we want to be able to discern between the two whatever venues that they're collected in, I suppose. All right, great. So it sounds like this is, oh, did you have something else to add? Just I did have a question actually. Um, Julian was talking about bringing in some information uh, that we already have. Um, and are, so Julian, are you talking about some things that would have been submitted in an annual report by one of our permittees showing um, yeah, it, uh, an, an area like the the type of information that they gathered to show that an area which used to be high or moderate or something like that uh, has been converted to to low, like sort of their their supporting data or yeah, I guess it wouldn't have to be um, it wouldn't have to be for a for the purpose of of like demonstrating success even just just the just that demonstrates the way that uh, a city is collecting data or a community group is collecting data. Um, I think what we're really interested in is the is the headers, the the kind of schema of of um, of a data um, a spreadsheet, really, that the, that you all might have, because um, we want we just want to know in it like in addition to the OVTA score, uh, what else you're collecting. Hopefully, you're collecting some kind of place based name or xy coordinate or like uh what project maybe it's associated with um maybe it drills down to different material groups that are that are noted or or even picked up and uh, collected um and we uh so i put that link in the chat uh it goes to a um a onedrive folder um, under my account. So you're, you're sharing it with me essentially, but with the whole group. Um, and if you have any restrictions around the data, uh, please let me know. We can, we can work through that. Um, but if anyone has any other, other data to submit that, as I said, really just gets at the, at the, the, the features of that data, the, the headers and the attributes and Maybe even a data dictionary would be really helpful. We got one contribution. Thank you. Uh, whoever did that. It's not letting me into the SharePoint, but um, I'll send it to you. Or I mean, I'll try again. You can email it to us. Yeah. Okay. I'll put my email in the chat. Sweet. Yeah, thank you to those who are willing to share some data. <clears throat> um, well, should we, I can, um, we can break out into breakout groups. So what we'll be doing in these breakout groups is we will be um, talking in more detail about each of these aspects, each of these uh, points along the data flow map. Um, and we will be diving into uh, Jamboard, um, which we'll be able to share with people. Basically, a Jamboard, you can add like sticky notes and stuff like that to these boards. And so we'll go through one at a time and talk about data creation. Who's doing that? How is it happening? What are some gaps and barriers there? Um, what are some opportunities for improvement? Um, so that's kind of what we'll be doing. We'll be going one step along the way, and, and I think we'll be learning a lot. Um, that's going to go for the next, uh, how much longer do we have right now? About 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, that's going to go for 30 minutes, um, and we'll just get as far as we can go. Um, I guess, yeah, we wanted to do like an all together wrap up, but 
Um, we might not get to that. We can, for those who can't come tomorrow, we'll send out all these details to you through email. And for those who do come tomorrow, we'll do a summary and sense consensus of the um, of of what we learned first thing when we get back. I think that'll be a good way to do it. Does that sound good? Okay. All right. Cool. Julian, do you know how to do the breakout groups? Yeah, can get it going. So we're gonna do two breakout groups automatically assigned. So there'll be six or seven participants in each. And so you'll see a um, you'll see a, a pop up on your screen. This is for everyone. You'll see a pop up on your screen that invites you to a breakout room, and you just have to click join. Okay. So here goes. Um, us four facilitators should be two in each. So if we end up with three in one and one in the other, then one of us will just hop over. Okay. Sounds good. All right, everyone. Here we go.